What's up everybody, I'm Jason, and welcome back to some more tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5. So in the last video, I talked about all of the sound recording settings, all five of them on the R5, and mentioned that I had done some basic performance testing. I also mentioned that that video was already too long and I didn't want to include it there, so I was going to do it as a separate video. Well, here we are. We're going to be talking about some basic audio, perform audio performance testing from the R5. Now, before I get into the details here, let me give you a brief overview of the methodology that I did. So all of the tests that I performed were performed with the camera set up for uncompressed LPCM audio. This is of course 16-bit 48 kilohertz on the R5, and that's the best quality audio that the camera can do. Additionally, the measurements that I made were made in Audacity, so the open source audio editing software, version 3.3.2. And by and large, the measurements consisted simply simply of loading in an approximately five second long clip of either the noise or of a signal, and then running the analyze measure RMS setting on it. Now on the camera side of things, I performed tests with the audio levels set at 1, 16, 32, 48, and 63, or positions on the slider. So one is the first, the lowest level that the camera supports, 63 is the highest, and 16, 32, and 48 are the three tick boxes or tick marks in between. I also performed both of these tests with and without the attenuator turned on. Now these were all being done through the external mic input because that's the relevant way I could have to test this. So I am not an audio engineer, and by that I don't mean guy who records things, but actually guy who designs microphones and stuff. I don't have access to an anechoic chamber, and I don't have access to the kind of speakers that you would use to do, say, a calibrated microphone profile or something like that. So I didn't really look at any of that on the internal microphone, and Quite honestly, given the quality of the audio from the internal microphone, I'm not sure why anybody would really care that much. So to measure dynamic range, you need to perform two tests, or you need to look at two levels, which I did independently. First is to look at the noise floor of the signal. Now the noise floor is the lowest signal that the system can distinguish, or the, the point, I guess, where noise overwhelms any smaller signals that are being distinguished. So it's the hiss that you hear in a recording that is when in quiet areas. Now the way that you do this is you have to first put a load on the input that's roughly equivalent to the kind of load that a microphone would provide. To do that, I simply plugged in my Rode VideoMic Pro, but left it turned off. So that would put the resistance that the audio system would expect to see or would see with a microphone plugged in, but the microphone provided no signal to the camera because it wasn't actually turned on. Typically, when you do this in a more scientific method, you would use a resistor hooked between the audio signals the same, or the audio signal lines the same way you would with a microphone. I tried that. I got the same kind of performance that I saw with the Rode video mic plugged in and turned off. Now, the reason I didn't go with the resistor is the when you do this kind of test, the resistors you use matter. Different resistors have different kinds of internal noises. And the kinds of resistors that I have from an electronic standpoint, where I really only use them as current limiting resistors in non-sensitive circuits, aren't the kind that have the lowest noise that you really want to have when doing these tests. Now, this is a very quick and dirty test. It's not to like 20 decimal points in the audio recording system on the R5 is sort of crude enough as it is that it probably didn't matter. But in the end, I chose to go with the video mic pro turned off instead of doing a resistor block like you normally would. Now, the other side of the dynamic range is the clipping point. And you could just assume that the clipping point would be at zero dB full scale uh, in the file, which would seem to make sense. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that that was the case because, well, I just had a weird feeling that maybe it wasn't. And it turns out that there are some places where it's not. Now to test this, you need some kind of signal that you have some control over. And the way I went about getting that signal was to use the one kilohertz sine wave test output that the Zoom F6 has that you can use to calibrate your line out on that to a line in on a downstream device. Simply hooked the F6 up to the R5 and then adjusted the output gain on the F6 until the level meter on the R5 was clipping. Whether it clipped at zero or it clipped somewhere else, if I couldn't put, or if I could put more gain in and it went up, I did that. If it 
if I adding more gain to the signal caused it to stay exactly where it was, then I took that to be the clipping point. So what do we see on the camera? Well, here we are looking at a chart of the noise performance, specifically the dynamic range with the camera's built-in attenuator off. And we can see first off that at the uh, camera level settings of one and 16, that the clipping point isn't actually at zero dB full scale. It's at minus 12 and minus three respectively. So this is important to know if you are trying to say set your levels and you want 12 decibels or 18 decibels of clipping, for my testing on the camera, your clipping point regardless, or your clipping point would have to be 12 to 18 decibels below minus 12, which is the marked, the, the top marked or the marked value on the camera. There's a minus 12 mark in the level meter. So you actually have to go well below that. And I, in my testing, I could not get the levels to come up above minus 12 or minus three in these two instances. Now, 81 and 84 or 82 and 85 decibels of dynamic range is not all that terrible. Remember, this is a 16-bit camera and the theoretical limit or 16-bit audio system and the theoretical limit of a 16-bit file is 94 decibels. So the fact that we're getting a good majority of that is uh, pretty reasonable. Setting the volume or the level on the camera to 32, the middle setting reduces the dynamic range to 75 decibels, give or take. At 48, it drops to 61 decibels, give or take. And at the full range or full level setting of 63, it drops under 50 decibels. Now for those last three settings, 32, 48, and 63, the clipping point is in fact at zero dB full scale in the digital files. Now, turning the attenuator on amazingly, or, or not maybe amazingly, improves things. So we still have that problem with not having clipping happening, happening at zero B, dB full scale in the digital file. But we see uh, 80.2 decibels of dynamic range with the camera at its minimum level of one, a really impressive 90.4 decibels at 16, 77.8 decibels at the middle setting of 32, 63.9 decibels at the second highest, or at the second highest hash, which is uh, 48, and 50.7 decibels at the full setting on the camera, the highest it will go. As I said, none of these actually clipped at zero dB full scale, but at least most of them were close enough to zero dB full scale that I'm not gonna worry about it too much. But again, at one uh, setting or level, record level of one, you do have a 12 or 13 decibel uh, clipping point below what the camera shows. Uh, it, the level meter just will not go above 12 decibels, essentially, or minus 12 decibels. So comparing the attenuated and non-attenuated dynamic ranges, we get this chart, and by and large, the attenuated dynamic range proves out to be slightly better than the unattenuated dynamic range. Now, the lesson that we can take away from this is largely that you are probably better off if you have to record on the camera. Uh, first of all, you wanna be down at the 16 gain or level setting on the camera if possible. And then on top of that, if possible, you want to have the attenuator turned on on the camera and have a hot source. So microphones like the Rode Video Mic Pros or, or Rode's on-camera microphones, in fact, a lot of the on-camera microphones, you can set them to have a 20 decibel boost and then take that away with the 20 decibel attenuator on the camera. And that should give you slightly better performance in terms of audio quality than shooting without the boost and having the camera, even if you are at the same level regardless, uh, you know, on the camera set to the same level, regardless of which way you go. Now, if you're like me and you shoot two system audio, in my experience, none of this really makes that big of a difference when you are just using it as the synchronization audio recorded on the video and you actually have real audio being recorded through a proper audio recorder off camera. So that is the so performance analysis that I conducted on the audio recording on the R5. If you see something that's interesting or maybe that I missed, or if you have a question or comment on the process or whatnot, remember I am not an expert in audio testing. So if I didn't do something quite right, leave a comment, let me know, and I'll see if I can rectify that if it's a real problem. Uh, 
If you found this useful, and I hope you did, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing is your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.